He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Hi, I'm Jen Halregal. Welcome to the Sportsman of the Year, a suburban philosophy. Just a warning before we get started, some of the language can get a bit tough at times. I am from West Auckland after all. And we also talk about some stuff you might find upsetting and some stuff you will hopefully find funny. So take care of yourselves, okay? The years leading up to my 40th birthday were not a particularly happy time for me. I was depressed, overweight, unfit, broke, separating from the father of my children, and I felt ugly, lost and very stuck. Day to day I wondered how I was going to cope with another 40 years of such a dismal and disappointing existence. It seemed to me that all my friends were starting to peak and were celebrating their achievements while all I could think about was what a complete and utter waste of time my music career had been, and all I could feel was broken down in suburban purgatory. My inner dialogue was, What a loser, Jan. Moan, moan, blather, blather. It's hard. A loser to me is someone who has lost their way and is not content with what they have on hand. It's someone who is stuck and can't find a way to move forward. Someone who blames others or is resentful because they don't have what they want in their life. Someone who makes excuses for never starting or always gives someone else credit for their misfortune. That was me, and by that definition, I was a loser. When I was young, I wanted to make a living as a musician, so I threw myself into a music career. Does anybody else get caught up in a vacuum? Skimming along, just bouncing off the walls. In the mid-80s, I started an indie girl band called Cassandra's Ears while I was studying at Otago University. After a year or so of playing together, we made some demo recordings. They were original songs, which I had written, and I'm going to be the first to admit some of them weren't very good and well we still had a lot to learn but we thought the songs were great and we were naively optimistic about our talent so we sent these cassette tapes to all the major and local record labels to see if we could get a record deal most of the response letters were handwritten or typed and said things like thank you but no or we enjoyed your demos but it's a no from us pretty standard refusals which were kind and polite but still clearly a no There was one letter, though, that we received from Flying Nun Records, which I have indelibly printed in my head. At the time, the person overseeing A&R, and no, it wasn't Roger Shepard, sent us a rejection letter and he didn't mince his words. It was something along the lines of, I think your music is fucking awful. The songs are bad and maybe you should think about giving up and then I don't think you have a future. We thought that was a bit harsh. But it was also a very important early lesson to learn because over time I have met a lot of people who haven't liked me, my work or what I do. So getting this comment at the beginning of my career prepared me for all of that. It hardened me up and taught me to have faith in what I do. I also recall it made me go, I'll show you. Which is very important because I think when we are criticised and decide to keep going just so we can prove to naysayers that we can do it, Well, this is very powerful and good for motivation. By the end of our five years together, Cassandra's Ears were a tight band and my songwriting skills had improved immeasurably. We had toured the country many times and recorded two EPs, Private Wasteland and Your Estimation, both self-financed. A few years ago I digitised them and made them into an album called The Cassandra's Ears Story. The album... And our one music video are all online if you would like to have a listen. I did end up signing a record deal eventually with Warner Music New Zealand and that was an amazing experience and one I will always cherish. 
You know those stories about recording artists who have a really bad time with their labels? Well, I don't have one of those. I have always been grateful to Warner Music, and because of them I have my two beautifully produced albums, It's My Sin and Tremble. But I never felt like I committed to the music industry 100%, and in the end, my dream of a career in music didn't fully come true. Something was always holding me back, and it was usually the concern about paying the rent and that old Protestant work ethic, you have to pay your way, and you have to pay it hard. I also never believed that I was good-looking or smart enough and that perhaps my music wasn't as good as everyone else's. I didn't have the confidence back then to step up and say, yes, I can do this and it's going to happen. I looked at everyone else and thought they were doing better than me. Of course, I was doing very well too. I just couldn't see it. At my lowest ebb, I started reading and asking a lot of questions. I looked at people who were successful, happy and content with their lives. I read as much as I could in terms of self-improvement and I studied business success with a voracious appetite. I was interested in marketing and sales, time management, self-help and improvement, inspirational lives, the law of attraction, autobiographical stories, subconscious programming, negotiation skills, NLP, sports psychology, etc. Anything that made me consider that there might be a way out of the quagmire I was wallowing in. What inspired me the most was how people overcame hurdles and obstructions and I was intrigued by the stories that accompanied these epiphanies. Day-to-day stories which moved from everyday ordinary to extraordinary. People like Jesse Owen, Louise Hay and Johnny Cash. I realised there were plenty of people who had managed to swing their lives in a new direction and many had come from a lot worse situations than mine. So I thought, I can do this, I can change my perception and turn my life around. It was time to pull finger and get a move on. Instead of regretting my past, I started to embrace it and use everything I'd learned to start dialling up a few dreams and aspirations and start working my way towards attaining them. And that is where suburban philosophy fits in, because I changed my view of the world without leaving my home in the suburbs of Auckland. For me, there was no option to opt out, to go off and study with great spiritual leaders, sell up and head to the wilderness, or even just be on my own, because I had a family to feed and a job to go to. And really, I was just trying to figure out how to navigate each day, be a good mum and pay the bills. I wanted to find a way forward and I figured if I was going to do it, then it would have to be at home. So it was while living in the suburbs, making school lunches, going to work, gardening and doing the dishes, that I figured out that I was already very rich in life because I was alive and breathing and that was all I needed and all I have ever needed to get started. Suburban philosophy is feeling grateful every day for where you are and what you have now. It is considering everything that you have in your life is perfect because you're in the middle of it and you trust that everything is unfolding around you as it should be. Little things resonate like pausing and finding delight in making your family a meal and then watching them eat it. Or walking around the neighbourhood and finding the most fantastic textures and colours in the flora. Knowing that your phone can take amazing photos and you can capture a moment of time to share on social media. Getting up early and catching the morning light reflecting off wet tar seal and thinking that it looks like the back of a whale. Being blown away by a well-crafted movie and thinking that the actors and storylines are amazing. Listening to your favourite music. Enjoying a cup of tea. So many wonderful things to be thankful for everywhere and every day. And we forget this so easily. Suburban philosophy is when you have found magic in your existence. You are the star in your own film and you feel loved and cherished. You chase your dreams and believe you can catch them. And you wake up mostly every day enjoying what you do. And if you don't, then you know you can do something about it. It's when you adore the world and the people in it 
and you realise there is a lot of good happening all around you and you want to contribute. My position now is I take the good with the bad. They are symbiotic because you don't grow unless you make mistakes or occasionally fall down. My other big discovery is gut instinct. If I think of an idea that I really want to explore, I don't ask how anymore. I just think I'll give it a go because I would prefer to fail than not try. Plus, if you do start, then somehow you seem to find the resources, knowledge or people that you need to help you finish what you set out to do. That's what happened with this project. Everything is fine now because I'm confident it's all as it should be. Everything is in the right place, even the flower growing out of the side of the house that you will eventually have to remove because it could cause damage to the brickwork. No, life isn't always easy, and I have yet to meet someone who says that it is. But it is amazing, and once you have accepted this, then things start firing and you can go with the flow more and enjoy the ride, because you will understand that everything is, and always has been, conspiring for you. This episode of Sportsman of the Year was written and performed by me, Jan Halregel. Justin Gregory was the producer and the engineer was Jana Witter. Tim Watkin is the executive producer. You can get the book Sportsman of the Year, A Suburban Philosophy, which comes with a high resolution download or you can get the CD too at my website, janhalregel.com or at record stores and bookshops who are stocking Sportsman of the Year. Ask them for it. You can subscribe to Sportsman of the Year at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Radio Public and, of course, rnz.co.nz forward slash series. Please give us a rating. More people find out about us that way. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.